Hello, today we're going to be doing a video on the history of graphics cards. We're going to look at primarily NVIDIA and ATI, but we're also going to look at Matrox and 3DFX and what their involvement was in the industry. We're going to do this by year, and we're also going to look at the games that were released those years to kind of do a comparison between the types of games and consumer demand that was out there versus the kinds of graphics cards that were available. In the year 1992, ATI had the Mach 32 introduced. NVIDIA, Matrox, and 3DFX were not on the scene with their own hardware at this point. Now it is important to mention that there were a lot of other graphics cards or graphics chip manufacturers that were developing chips to put into desktop PCs and other devices. 1992 brought us the game Dune 2, as well as Civilization. Civilization is a very popular game, and Dune 2 was kind of what sparked real-time strategy games to really take off. Uh, a lot of the games back then, you know, you were looking at your Sierra games, your Space Quests, your uh, Police Quests. I mean, you can go even further back than that. But Dune 2 really kind of capitalized on the real-time strategy games. In 1993, there were no major card releases from either of the manufacturers. But 1993 brought us Doom which, as everybody knows, Doom basically launched the uh, first-person shooter uh, video game genre uh, into where it is today. 1993 also brought us X-Wing, which was a space simulator. 1993 also brought us some console games like Star Fox, which really made, were game changers as far as how you played games and how games functioned and really the graphics capabilities that those games took advantage of. 1993 also brought us the Day of the Tentacle, which was kind of a adventure game, and also brought us SimCity 2000. In 1994, ATI launched the Mach 64 graphics card, and Matrox launched their impression card. 1994 brought us Doom 2, and it also brought us Warcraft, which was an epic game changer in the gaming world. Uh, Warcraft went on, obviously, to become one of the biggest franchises of all time. 1994 also brought us Wing Commander 3. We also saw Super Metroid from the SNES, Final Fantasy VI, Donkey Kong Country, Tekken, and we also saw a game called Heretic that was introduced, similar to the Doom genre first-person shooter games. We also saw the Elder Scrolls being introduced. In 1995, NVIDIA released their first NV1 graphics card, also known as the Diamond Edge 3D, the NV1 was actually able to edge out the card introduced by ATI in 1995, which was the 3D Rage. Matrox also introduced the first version of their Matrox Millennium card, uh, and we had games such as Rise of the Triad to continue on the first-person franchise. We had Warcraft 2, which I remember spending hundreds of hours playing. Uh, we also had Chrono Trigger, which brought in, uh, you know, more popularity for the RPG brand. We had Mortal Kombat 3, extending the fighter game genre. And we had Descent. Descent was one game that I played hours and hours and hours of. Descent actually came packaged with the Diamond Edge 3D card. Descent was, again, it was a first-person shooter type game, but it was kind of a you know, free free roaming uh, three axis game where you could go up, down, left, right, any direction. And that game really, again, pushed the possibility of what you could do in a 3D graphics engine. 1995 also brought us Full Throttle, which was another adventure game. And we also saw the first rendition of Command and Conquer in 1995. In 1996, NVIDIA was developing the NV2 card, which was never actually released, while ATI managed to release the Rage 3D2, or the 3D Rage 2, which managed to edge out the competition from the NV1, placing ATI back on the top as far as top-performing graphics cards were concerned. 1996 also brought us the Matrox Mystique graphics card, and 3DFX introduced their first Voodoo graphics card using the Glide API. The Voodoo card was another game changer and brought in a third major competitor between NVIDIA, ATI, and 3DFX. Matrox always focused more on the workstation graphics hardware, while NVIDIA, ATI, and 3DFX saw the potential in the gaming market and wanted to focus primarily on enthusiast hardware. 1996 brought us Duke Nukem 3D. It brought us the 
ever game changing Quake. We also had a few console games, Resident Evil, Mario 64, which were game changers in their own genre, bringing 3D graphics uh, into the living room for everyone to see. Uh, the Nintendo 64 obviously playing a huge role in that. Uh, 1996 also brought us Civilization 2, The Elder Scrolls 2, and Diablo. And we still have Diablo 3 being played in mass. And 1996 also brought us Tomb Raider, which was a really cool 3D adventure game that brought together, kind of pushing the limits of what a 3D graphics engine could do, uh, as well as CPUs at the time. In 1997, NVIDIA released their NV3 card called the Riva 128, and ATI released their Rage Pro, Matrox released another version of their Mystique card, and the 3DFX released the Voodoo Rush card. Now the best card out of those turned out to be the Riva 128 from NVIDIA, placing NVIDIA once again on the top of best cards for gaming. 1997 brought us a lot more focus on 3D with the introduction of Direct3D and OpenGL 1.1. 1 .1. 1997 brought us games such as Quake 2, X-Wing vs. TIE Fighter, which was one of uh, the best kind of space simulator genre games of its time. We also saw Final Fantasy VII, which was a probably the best Final Fantasy VII. It made the biggest jump and leap from uh, Final Fantasy VI, which was a two-dimensional game, to Final Fantasy VII, which was fully 3D, albeit it was very choppy and the graphics were kind of blocky, but uh, that game still holds a special place in my heart. 1997 also brought us Star Fox 64, which was probably one of my favorite N64 video games. We also saw Total Annihilation from the company Cave Dog, and that was another uh, real-time strategy game changer. Uh, there was a lot of uh, 3D utilized in that game. Actual true 3D models were used for the units. And 3D was really kind of starting to push the limits of what it could do in 1997. Uh, again, games were a huge push. The game market and the game consumer market were a huge push in getting graphics companies to bring out better, faster graphics cards as quickly as they could. And the fact that we kept having better games written with more demand for the graphics engines as these games kept coming out, people were demanding them, consumers were buying them, and graphics card manufacturers just had to try to keep up. And if they could keep up, it was a goldmine for them. They could just keep making money. 1997 also brought us Star Wars Jedi Knight Dark Forces 2, which was, again, an excellent first-person shooter type game. Uh, we also saw Wing Commander Prophecy, and for the PlayStation, we saw Gran Turismo, which kind of uh, was the start of the racing simulator genre taken to extreme levels of true realistic simulation uh, to the highest extent that we could reach at that time. In 1998, we had another surge of graphics cards released onto the market. We had NVIDIA's Riva TNT. We had ATI's Rage 128. We had Matrox, uh, another version of the Matrox Millennium that was made available, as well as 3DFX released their Voodoo Banshee. 1998 saw some very good games released. We saw Unreal, which brought a whole new level to graphics for the first-person shooter. We saw Half-Life, which again was on a new graphics engine that pushed the limits of what our computers could handle. We had Metal Gear Solid, we had Rainbow Six, uh, we had StarCraft released from Blizzard, uh, we had Fallout 2, we had Heretic 2, we had uh, an excellent game that I really enjoyed, which was Thief the Dark Project. We had now in 1998, we kind of had the push for multiplayer games to kind of start making their way into the market. So we had Star Siege Tribes, we had Mario Party, um, bearing in mind that only a few years earlier, we were being forced to connect up with our friends to play Warcraft 2 through dial-up because internet wasn't a prevalent thing at that point. But gaming didn't stop there. New games kept coming out, new graphics cards were needed to push the limits of what we could do. In 1999, NVIDIA released the GeForce 256 SDR, ATI released the Rage Fury, and 3DFX released the Voodoo 3 3500 TVSE card. Those were the best cards released in 1999, and the benchmarks show that the GeForce 256 SDR still was able to hold reign over 
for the title of best graphics card performance in 1999. Now we're not looking at best graphics versus dollars versus money. We're just looking at the highest benchmark and graphics card available in that year. 1999 brought us Quake 3 Arena. It brought us the ever awesome Unreal Tournament. We also saw Super Smash Brothers. We saw EverQuest, which again was a massive growth for the online community, bringing more and more gamers into the gaming genre, into the PC genre. Uh, we saw Roller Coaster Tycoon. We saw Baldur's Gate. We saw Descent 3. Again, Descent 3, a huge evolution from just a few years earlier. Uh, where the graphics were kind of choppy and not very good. Descent 3 was fully 3D, excellent graphics, uh, full fog, volumetric fog. Um, we had Dungeon Keeper 2, we had Homeworld, and we had Ultima 9 Ascension. In the year 2000, we saw the GeForce 2 MX from NVIDIA. We saw the Radeon 7200 from ATI. And the final release from 3DFX, we saw the Voodoo 5 5500. Now, when we look at graphics comparisons, which card is the best? Uh, we see that ATI actually takes the crown from NVIDIA in the year 2000 with the Radeon 7200. The year 2000 brought us The Sims. It brought us Soldier of Fortune. It brought us Deus Ex. And it also brought us Diablo 2, as well as a new Age of Empires 2. 2001, NVIDIA released the GeForce 3 TI 500, and ATI released the Radeon 8500. The Radeon 8500 secured the crown for ATI in 2001 as be highest benchmarking graphics card. 2001 brought us Stronghold. Dark Age of Camelot, Halo, RuneScape, Clive Barker's Undying, which was a horror game genre brought into first-person shooter. 2001 brought us Tribes 2, it brought us Serious Sam, it brought us Max Payne. It also brought us Civilization 3, which took the Civilization game to a whole new scale. We also saw some more creative games released, such as Black and White from Lionhead Studios. In 2002, NVIDIA released their GeForce 4 TI-4600. ATI also had their Radeon 9700, which maintained their lead over NVIDIA. Matrox tried getting back into the crowd with the Matrox Pirelia. This card was their next attempt at getting back into the 3D gaming genre, and it would be their last. 2002 brought us Serious Sam Second Encounter. It brought us Warcraft 3, which was a completely 3D version of Warcraft using full 3D models, bringing the graphics and pushing the graphics cards even harder to the next level. 2002 brought us Battlefield 1942, Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast. It brought us Dungeon Siege, Elder Scrolls 3, Grand Theft Auto 3. We had Neverwinter Nights. 2002 also brought us Medieval Total War and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. In 2003, NVIDIA brought us the GeForce FX 5950 Ultra to try to compete with ATI's Radeon 9800 XT. The Radeon 9800 XT was still able to get higher benchmarking ratings than the GeForce FX 5950. 2003 brought us Unreal 2. It brought us Call of Duty. It brought us Deus Ex Invisible War. It brought us Freelancer which was a wonderful space sim that you could actually play multiplayer with your friends and had a wonderful single-player campaign. It brought us SimCity 4. It brought us Splinter Cell. Uh, 2003 brought us Planet Side. It brought us Star Wars Galaxies. We saw Jedi Academy. We saw Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, which is still to this day one of my favorite games uh, that, that has come out as far as role-playing games go. In 2004... NVIDIA brought out the GeForce 6800 Ultra Extreme. That was to compete with X850 XT Platinum Edition. The X850 XT was probably one of my favorite cards of all time. It was the last AGP rendition graphics card that was available before the AGP interface was, was discontinued and fully replaced by PCI Express. And the Radeon X850 XT Pl Platinum Edition still reigned supreme over NVIDIA. So NVIDIA... If you look year over years, from 2000 to 2004, we still have ATI reigning as the top benchmarking graphics card of the year. 2004 brought us Halo 2. It brought us the 
ever popular World of Warcraft. It brought us Unreal Tournament 2004. It brought us Far Cry, Doom 3, Star Wars Battlefront, Roller Coaster Tycoon 3, EverQuest 2, Half-Life 2. It also brought us Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2. It's hard to think that only 10 years earlier our games were 8-bit graphics and 8-bit and sound and you know bleeps and bloops instead of fully cinematic cutscenes. So in 2005, as things push even harder in games and gamers get even more demanding on what they want to see for next-gen graphics, NVIDIA releases the GeForce 7800 GTX to compete with the Radeon X1800 XT from ATI. But once again, ATI takes the crown for a top benchmarking graphics card. 2005 brought us Guild Wars, Battlefield 2, Dungeon Seed 2, Black and White 2, Serious Sam 2. It brought us Fear, which was actually directed by Warner Brothers, which was a wonderful concoction of taking horror movie genre and mixing it with first-person shooter play, and it pushed graphics to the limit with lighting effects and shadow effects to try to really immerse gamers into the game. We also saw Quake 4, Age of Empires 3, Call of Duty 2, Civilization 4, Need for Speed Most Wanted. By 2005, the gaming genre is massive. People want to play games. Entertainment is one of the biggest industries in the world, and gaming is no exception. In 2006, NVIDIA gets serious. They introduce the GeForce 8800 GTX. ATI releases the Radeon X1950 XT, but the 8800 GTX takes the crown with the best benchmarks and performance of the year. 2006 brought us Elder Scrolls Oblivion, which has eaten hundreds of thousands of hours of gamers' time. It brought us X2 The Threat, a lesser-known space sim that pushed graphics to the limit. It brought us Company of Heroes, Battlefield 2142, Neverwinter Nights 2, in 2007, NVIDIA retains their crown with the GeForce 8800 Ultra. ATI tries to catch up by releasing the Radeon HD 2900 XT. Now, I want to point out that the margins between performance between ATI and NVIDIA were always very, very close. Regardless of who took the crown, you were talking a matter of 5 to 10 frames per second. Uh, you were looking at a 15 to 20 percent maximum gain. 2007 brought us Halo 3. It brought us Supreme Commander, which was kind of the next rendition of Total Annihilation that pushed 3D graphics and RTS games to the maximum. We had Command & Conquer 3, Tiberium Wars. We had Overlord. We had the ever-popular Bioshock. There was also the short-lived Hellgate London that was only available for about 12 months before they cut off the servers to play, but the graphics were next-gen. 2007 also brought us the greatest gaming meme of all time, Crisis. Posing the question of, but can it play Crisis, that still lives on today. 2007 also brought us Unreal Tournament 3. And 2008, NVIDIA once again retains their crown, releasing the GeForce 9800 GTX Plus. ATI releases the Radeon HD 3870X2, which is a very powerful card, and actually outperforms the 9800 in some areas, but the 9800 GTX Plus still took the crown as best benchmarked card of the year. 2008 brought us such eclectic games like Assassin's Creed, Mass Effect, and EA's new take on evolutionary games, Spore. We also saw Age of Conan, which turned into a massive game of people running around topless, and Devil May Cry 4. So that's kind of a history of the graphics cards and what came out and when. I also want to take a quick minute to throw a special mention out there to one of the graphics cards that was being developed in the year 2000. 3DFX was developing the Voodoo 5 6000, which was a multi-GPU card that actually used their rendition of SLI at the time to allow those GPUs to work together to render a single image on your screen. The Voodoo 5 6000 was an epic card. The card was nearly 18 inches long, required an external power supply because the AGP slot at the time wasn't able to handle, handle the kind of power that it required. 
And the Voodoo 5 6000 never actually saw the light of day. There were about a thousand of them designed. Now, the Voodoo 5 6000 obviously never went to market. What happened was 3DFX actually went bankrupt. NVIDIA saw the potential from 3DFX and purchased up their intellectual property. NVIDIA would later release their version of SLI, which was created from a lot of the fruits of the effort of 3DFX, and they would implement that into their own cards. The first card to actually have SLI was the Voodoo 2, which allowed users to plug two Voodoo 2s together and use them as a single graphics card to render. So the SLI technology that NVIDIA uses today actually comes from the acquisition of 3DFX. That brings us to the close of the first part of the history of graphics cards covering 1992 to 2008. For the rest of the history, please check out Profound Gaming's channel. The link will be in the comments and in the description below.